So good morning again, everyone. Um, let us just uh, start by looking at our Blackboard site. So let me just go to the home page. Um, as you would have seen in the email that we sent out uh, yesterday afternoon, the new uh, question bank, the, the question bank on tax matters has become available. So if you click on content general, right, you, you know there, there's a subject guide and notes and question banks and assessments from prior years. By the way, last year's, uh, uh, not last year's, the 2019 class test two, we've also made available yesterday. So remember, you are writing class test two on this on the 3rd of May. So that corresponding class test from 2019 is now available under assessments from prior years. But anyway, if you go to notes and question banks, uh, I've got a lot of sort of noise here on my side, but you will see there's now something called taxation question bank. Uh, that same question bank also appears under under uh, the folder for taxation. So the folder that is under, let me just display it, under content per topic. And if you go to our next topic, which is the one that we're starting today, topic five, taxation, if you click on that, it's also there. It's right at the bottom this this time. So I'm going to leave all the various uh, uh, lessons, the, the, the narrated slideshows. There are many slideshows for three, Two, two times two, so four, four additional slideshows that will still be made available. So I'm going to, for this time, leave them at the top, and then all the questions will appear below them. Okay, ladies and gents, so the idea now, first of all, before we look at the class examples, is just to just talk about tax in general. Um, do you know when our June timetable will be made available? No, I don't. I know that there is a provisional one out, uh, but I think they are still checking for clashes and for anomalies and anything that can go wrong. So the final one um, has not been sent out yet, so we can't publish it yet. So I'm afraid I, I can't give you an estimated time of arrival in ETA either. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, the last few, few years, um, 2020, 2021, and 2022, they were all online tests. So they were just on Blackboard, multiple multiple pools of questions that were that 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 uh, gets drawn into into random blocks. So so there are no specific papers for the last three years. But that, Mrs. Morris, oh, Mrs. Morris, <laughs> Mrs. Moore can attest to this. I was looking at Morrison there. Um, Mrs. Moore can attest to, to this. I don't think the, the, the papers have changed in the last like two decades that much. You know, the um they 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 remain consistent from the one year to the next because we are covering the same topics and uh, there were no new uh, standards out on them. Uh, it's only if there's a there's a new standard that comes out on a specific uh, topic that that we really have to adjust adjust the, the, the way that we that we presented and the way that it is being asked. Okay, so let us now just talk about tax in general, ladies and gents. Now, when it comes, and, and then we are going to look at class examples one and two. When it comes to tax, um, or let, let me go even a little bit further back. When we talk about government finances, now, uh, every country every country has got a an administration right we, we we vote for for a certain administration we call it the government and they their responsibility is to ensure that they run the business we call the republic of south africa properly so in all for 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 in all major respects a government is also a big business right uh, 12 um, I don't know when the recording will be available, but it will be before five o'clock today. Okay, that's all I can say because uh, it all depends on my load shedding as well, but it will be before five. That's the best I can assure you at the moment. So the administration of a, of a country or of a province or even a city, you know, they also have to apply solid business principles. Uh, why why I'm leading up with this is they also need a cash flow like any business a business needs cash flow 
So a business can do sales on credit for, for until it comes out of their ears, but if their customers do not pay them, then they can't pay their suppliers, they can't pay their wages and salaries, so they become cash strapped. So any business needs a cash flow. They need cash, right? That's why we in the in, in the last term of this year, we're also going to look at the statement of cash flows because that is an important aspect of business and of government. So ladies and gentlemen, there are all sorts of methods in place by law, by the Income Tax Act and a few other uh, acts as well, that ensures that the, the, the administration of the day has a solid cash flow. So they cannot rely, for instance, just on uh, uh, once a year at the end of a, of a tax year or a fiscal year that, that the, the whole country then suddenly makes payment at the same time and then the rest of the year they got no income, right? They no, got no income. There was always a joke many years ago that said it is so strange that we've got one department, the Department of Finance, one department that, that must ensure income for the government, but we've got dozens of departments that can do the expenditure. Right? But anyway, um, our, our, our income uh, uh, revenue service, which is, which is an independent agency, by the way, it's an independent agency employed by the Department of Finance, they are actually quite efficient. So ladies and gentlemen, what happens in practice is if you are employed, right, you are working for someone and they pay you a salary or they pay you a wage, they deduct a portion from your wage or from your salary each month, which is the tax. <clears throat> so they have, there are tax tables that are published by the Revenue Service uh, SARS tax tables, which indicates if you are earning this amount of salary a month or this amount of wage a week, then that is the amount of tax that must be deducted. That is called the P-A-Y-E, pay as you earn system, right? P-A-Y-E or pay, pay as you earn. So every month, and uh, every month, at the least every month, uh, the, the, the receiver of revenue or the South African Revenue Service will receive taxes from all those uh, uh, employees of the various businesses and of government departments, right? So that creates a cash flow for, for them. So um, at the end of every month, every employer that pays salaries and wages, they must have they must have withdrawn or they must have taken off the tax from the salaries and wages. They pay over the net salaries and wages after all the deductions. There are other deductions as well, such as pension fund contributions, unemployment insurance fund contributions, and so forth. Uh, they pay over the net amount to the employee and they pay over, amongst other things, the tax portion over to the revenue service. Right. But what now happens with business people or business entities? Uh, they are not employed, so they are not receiving a salary. They are not receiving a wage. So how does the government actually make sure that they get a proper cash flow throughout the year from those various entities? So any business entity, whether it's a sole trader, a natural person, or partners in a business which are also natural persons, or a close corporation, or a company which are not natural persons, but they are legal persons, right? So they are a legal entities, so they are regarded as persons in their own right. That is why a company and a CC can own its own assets and it has its own liabilities. So what happens in the case of all of them? Those business entities and people, sole traders, partners in businesses, close corporations, uh, companies, they are, they need to be provisional taxpayers. The Income Tax Act refers to them as provisional taxpayers. So what does it mean if you are a provisional taxpayer? Any business, I know that we are going to be focusing on companies uh, during our discussions, but I'm just speaking broadly now. So any business entity, whether it be a natural person or a legal entity such as a company, 
they have to pay their next years, the, the, the current year, the year that they are in, they, they must pay certain portions of their tax that they estimate they will have to pay it uh, for the year up front. Now, when I say up front, I don't mean right at the beginning of the year. They should actually pay their tax provisionally twice a year. So two times a year, any provisional taxpayer must make a payment halfway through the year and they must make another payment at the end of the year. And then they will draw up their financial statements. They will estimate what their full year's uh, uh, tax income tax expense should be. They will submit their, their, their financial statements together with their, with their tax return, which is an ITA 14 return to the South African Revenue Service, and then they will finally calculate whether your estimate is correct or not. And we're going to talk about those situations soon. But let us just get the, the, the very basic idea straight here. Let's say, for instance, now, and now we are only talking companies because when it comes to, to well, companies or close corporations, because when it comes to natural persons, whether they are sole traders, or, or, or partners in a business, every natural person's fiscal year or, or tax year ends on the 28th of February or the last day of February of each year. In a leap year, it'll obviously be the 29th of February. But companies and close corporations, they can have their year end any time during the course of a calendar year, right? So their financial year uh, can end any time during a calendar year. So let us just think about a few scenarios. Let's say this company has a financial year end ending on the 31st of December, right? Financial year ends on the 31st of December. Before or on which date must that company make its first provisional tax payment for that financial year? You can type in the chat for me, please. Mrs. Moore, you're also welcome to, to ask the students a few questions. We yes. warned them in the yes. email. Ask the students, Mr. Van Rensburg. <laughs> we are going to test you a little bit, students. Uh, Christopher Malley, not the 1st of June, but the 30th of June, right? The 30th of June. of June. Yeah. So it's got to be uh, before the last day of the halfway point of the year. So if they've got a financial year end, but it's a, it's a good try there. Thank you, Finney. You, at least I know that you are on the right track. You can see what where we are going with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So if the financial, I'm going to do that just now, Zana. Uh, so if the company's financial year ends on the 31st of December and they have to make their first provisional tax payer on or before the last day of the halfway mark of the year, when do they have to make it? Before or on the 30th of June. I don't think any accountant will actually pay it on the 30th of June because sometimes it takes a day or two if, especially if you're not using the correct bank account. I know that the, the, the South African Revenue Service has bank accounts with all the major banks. So the Revenue Service has a bank account with Standard Bank and with APSA and with NetBank and with Capitec. So, so they have bank accounts at all the major banks, right? So if you are, as a company, if you are banking at, let's say, let's say you're banking with NetBank, for instance, right? and you transfer it into SARS's net bank account on the 30th of June, then SARS will actually receive it on the 30th of June. So that's all, all fine, fine and dandy. But if you are so stupid an accountant and you are banking with net bank and you transfer it, let's say, into uh, uh, the South African Revenues APSA account on the 30th of June, then it means the revenue service will only receive it in their APSA account on the 1st of July, right? And then it means you're late and they're going to slap a penalty. They're going to slap you 10% penalty on that late payment, right? Which can be quite a, quite a substantial amount. So most accountants, just to be sure, just to be safe, I should say, 
would rather make that payment by, let's say, the latest, the 29th of June already. Okay, but anyway, that's besides the point. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we say that before the last day of the year, they've got to make their second provisional tax payment. So if this company's year end is the 31st of December, ladies and gentlemen, before or on which date must they make the second provisional tax payment? Before or on which date? That's the first. Well, technically, the first. <laughs> I like that. I like those answers of 30 December and 30. Thank you, um, Asiva. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Finney. Right. So, technically, it's the 31st of December. But now you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if the 31st of December is a Sunday, right? It's a Sunday. Then it doesn't matter. Uh, well, it, it does matter which bank you're transferring it to. But I would then at least make sure that I've made my provisional tax payment, let's say by the Friday. Because if I make it by the Friday, which is now the 29th of, of, of December, then I'm pretty sure that it will be in SARS's account uh, on Saturday, the, the, the 30th of December, right? So there are a few little tricky things to consider, but um, that, that was just for fun. To be honest, that was just for fun. The true answer is, that technically, yes, according to the law and the Act, the Income Tax Act, you must make your second provisional tax payment on or before the 31st of December, right? At the very least, we can say that SARS, the South African Revenue Service, must receive the money in their bank account. I think that's probably a better way to describe it, Mrs. Moore. They must receive it before the last day of the year, right? When, yes. doesn't matter when you pay it. As long as they receive it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Now there there are there are a few things that one has got to take into account here, and that is when you are making your first provisional tax payment. There the power has just come on on my side. The power has just come on, so I'm just going to give it a, a two or three or four minutes for the. Um, Mine for the still hasn't come on yet, but I'm sure it is going to come on any minute. You know, sometimes it it's just like. On. A a stagger. Yeah. Just... Okay. Yeah. Why? Why I know my my electricity has come on my my I, I just for in case I put my my laptop in battery saver mode. So suddenly the clear be, the, the screen became clear and bright again. <laughs> so, no, I just but now... uh, flick the switch now. Mine is still off. But it, uh, you know they normally put it on in stages like that. So mine should come on yeah. like any time now. Absolutely. I always imagine there's one guy sitting and pulling the little lever key, so your turn will come soon. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that is true because they do flick them gradually. I mean, it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's not a done Absolutely. deal that even though we are all under the same number, they switch on by area normally. Yeah, no, absolutely. There, there will be a little lever for, for every area that they must go exactly. and flick. So and sometimes just for fun, they do it from left to right. And other times <laughs> so, from the right to left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. just the luck of the draw, whether you're going to be one of the first ones or one of the last ones. One of ones. the last ones, yeah. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Right, so um, the, the little problem that we, that we now face in reality is that when you make your first provisional payment, you are only halfway through the year. And many things can change in the second part of the year. Your business can 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 grow, it can expand, it can become more profitable, or the or vice versa, it can become less profitable. But the fact is, halfway through the year, you've only got records for the first five or six months for the year. So you've got to base your your uh, uh, provisional tax payment, your first one, on that. What many companies, in fact, do, and the Income Tax Act does allow it. They also say that you can use half of your previous year's total income tax expense to base your first provisional tax payment on. So if you had a, let's say for your previous year, you had a, a taxable taxable profit of, of 2 million rands, 
then you can then you can use that. So then you can say, um, I'm going to expect my next year also to be two million rands. So I'm going to pay on one million rands for my first provisional tax payment, right? So that is allowed. Even at the end of the year, when you have to make your second provisional tax payment, you might only have 11 months of complete records, right? And as you know from financial accounting one, there are still all sorts of year-end adjustments that you have to go and do, um, you know, your depreciation calculations, corrections of errors, accruals, prepayments, those kinds of things. So they might not even have been taken into account by that date yet. But then, then basically, uh, in, in essence, you are going to base your, your second provisional tax payment on what you believe your profit for the full year will be. So you're going to project it uh, by using, let's say, the first 11 months' records for, for that year. And after the financial year end, then you know that you are going to have to draw up your financial statements. So you start drawing up your financial statements, you do your corrections of errors, you do your accruals, uh, correct uh, all your year end adjustments, and then you get to a final post adjustment trial balance and you can actually draw up your financial statements. Now, at that point in time, you do have a complete record of the full year's transactions and events, right? <clears throat> so then it means you can make a more, much, much more accurate estimate uh, what your, your, your income tax expense for the year will be. So you know that you have to disclose the income tax expense for the year in your financial statements. So you, you are going to do your tax calculations, which we'll talk about in a in a future class, possibly today, otherwise next week. Uh, and, and then you, 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 you do the, the journal entry to create your uh, income tax expense on the debit side and your current tax payable for income tax on the credit side. And then you can finish your, your, your financial statements. But there's still a little trick here. You know, um, they often refer to this as a catch-22 situation. Catch-22 comes from a book that was written by Joseph Heller in, I think it was about 1961, thereabouts. Um, in, in any case, it describes an almost impossible situation, and a situation where, where it can almost not be done. <laughs> so what, what, what happens here, ladies and gentlemen, is first of all, let, let me give you a typical example of a Catch-22 situation, a different example. <clears throat> No, class, class test two will only be on shares, so well. class test two only on share capital, but formal test two will be share capital as well as 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 uh, taxation, right? The um, the the you're welcome, so well. the um, assignment that will become available to you on Workers' Day on Workers' Day, so you've got to work on Workers' Day on the first of May also includes tax matters, right? And that must then be submitted two weeks after that. So the, what's it, the 15th of May. Anyway, I digress. So class test two, yes, only share capital, but formal test two and the assignment will cover share capital as well as tax matters. So a typical, I know this sounds quite crazy because it is, a typical situation where you get a catch-22 uh, scenario is where let's say you as a student, they say, student, you can only get your new student card in the admin building, right? You can only get that in the admin building. And in the same breath, they say, sorry, you cannot enter the admin building without the latest student card, <laughs> right? So that is a catch-22 situation. You've got to get your student card in the admin building, but you cannot get into the admin building because you do not have a student card. <laughs> okay. uh, class test two is on the 3rd, 3rd of May. Thank you, Asiva. Uh, there are Asiva answers as well. On the 3rd of May, during this time, during this, this, this class period, online class period time, right? So it starts at the at quarter to 12. Oh, my word, I've forgotten to change my... my um, my connection, uh, students and Mrs. Moore, excuse me just for a second, or, or not a second, probably a minute or two. I'm just going to switch over to to the uh, Wi-Fi from the 
yeah, to the Wi-Fi, if you can just hang on a second. Okay, I think you should be able to hear me now again, so it didn't take that long. Can you just confirm that, that you can hear me now? Yes, you are back in, Mr. Van Rensburg. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Moore. Okay, so that didn't take too long. Now, I don't know whether I... Sorry, I've just got to sort out this, this uh, dongle as well. Okay, that's done now. So, so that is typically a catch-22 situation. <clears throat> so what happens at the end of the year, you draw up your financial statements. You have, to, you have to estimate, you have to include a figure for your income tax expense in your financial statements, right? But you can only, as an accountant, you can only estimate it. And then the, the, where the catch-22 situation, com situation comes in, you have to disclose an income tax expense in your financial statements, but then thereafter, you have to submit your financial statements together with your tax return, that, uh, what did we say, these ITA 14, I think it is, to the revenue service, and only once the revenue service has received that, will they assess you, they will do a tax assessment, so then they will use your financial statements to see whether they actually agree with the amount that you have disclosed as an income tax expense. And that has all sorts of ramifications and repercussions that we as accountants have to know about and that we as accountants have to be able to account for, right? And that is what this, this whole topic of taxation is all about. So we are going to look at all the pitfalls and, and all the processes and all the procedures in order for us to be able to have proper, fairly presented financial statements, including our income tax expense and including our various income tax liabilities and even other tax liabilities such as dividends tax and employees tax, um, what else is there, capital gains tax and so on, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So that is that is the the background. So we've got we've we've basically got three stages where we have to estimate our income tax expense for the year, which is at the halfway stage of the year, the financial year, at the end of the financial year, and then after the financial year when we draw up our financial statements, then we submit our financial statements. Well to our shareholders primarily, but and any other stakeholder of the company, but also the South African Revenue Service, and then they will look at our calculations, and if they agree with it, then uh, we are all happy, we're on the same page. If they don't agree with it, there are many processes that follow on. Maybe we can just talk about those processes now as well. Uh, some of them we are going to be dealing with in financial accounting too, some not. So, ladies and gentlemen, once you've submitted your, your um, yeah, it's still on Blackboard. Sorry, I'll move away soon. I'll move away soon, Fanny. Sorry, I'm, I'm just talking generally first. Uh, then, then I'll display something else. Um, what was I about to say? Now I forget. Um, What, what did I say just before I looked at that message? <laughs> I forget. My mind is going. No, no, you know, I'm on the same train with you, so I've also kind of lost the train of thought now. <laughs> it's gone, it's gone. But anyway, um, yeah, I can't think what it was exactly what I was saying. Um, anyway, uh, there's there's no rewind button on, on this recording. So. <laughs> ah, the procedures, yes, the procedures. Thank you, Lucille, thank you. Now I know what we were talking about. So at the end of the year, once you've submitted your, or after the end of the year, once you've submitted your, your, your tax return together with your financial statements, and then uh, the, the revenue service will check your, your, your calculations, and they will then send you a document back, which is called the assessment for the year. 
That is the assessment. And in that assessment, they will tell you and they will show you the details how they calculated your tax expense for the year and then whether there's a liability or whether you're going to get a refund, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, if, if their tax assessment agrees with, with our uh, estimate for the income tax expense, then there's nothing really more to do. But if it doesn't agree, there are quite a few uh, procedures that we have to complete. The first thing, and this is not really part of financial accounting too, this is just for interest sake. The first thing is that you as an accountant does not simply have to accept that assessment, right? If you look at their workings and you believe that they are wrong and you are right, then you can object against that assessment, right? Then SARS, the revenue service, if they see your, your, your objection, your objection and they work through it and they believe they are right and you are wrong, they can reject your objection, right? <laughs> then, ladies and gentlemen, you, if, when they object, when they reject your objection, you can appeal against their rejection of your objection. <laughs> okay. And you, if, if you appeal that, ladies and gentlemen, it means that SARS has to go and again look at your calculations and then they can reject your, your appeal. <laughs> okay. And then you are almost out of, out of options. Then your very last option is if you are still adamant that you are correct and that SARS is incorrect, you can take it to a special tax court. And at the tax court, there will be a judge that will decide whether SARS is correct or whether you as an accountant is correct. <laughs> anyway, so those are the procedures. And thank you, Lucille, for, for reminding me. But ladies and gentlemen, for our purposes, for financial accounting to academic purposes, we are not going to do the objections and the appeals and taking it to a tax court. <clears throat> but we must just be aware that we can, right? We are able to according to the law. For our purposes, we are just simply going to lamely and meekly say SARS was correct and we were wrong. <laughs> okay. So when once we've done our financial statements and we've made an estimate of the income tax expense for the year and SARS has assessed it and they've sent us the assessment for financial accounting to academic purposes, we will then say SARS is correct and we were wrong. So we will have to go and make an adjustment for in, in our books of accounts so that our income tax expense uh, for the year agrees with that of the calculation of SARS. Thereby also hangs a tail because there's also a little story there because by this time we have closed off last year's financial uh, uh, books, right? Our, our books of accounts, our ledgers have been closed off, which means that we will now in this new, new current financial year have to go and adjust for what we refer to as either an over provision or an under provision for income tax expense for last year in this year's account, right? So it relates to last year, but we'll have to do it in this year's books of account. Okay. Um, now, Fanny will be relieved. I'm going to stop sharing the, the Blackboard site and I'm going to share a different uh, document. This is the first few pages of the taxation question bank, ladies and gentlemen. So it is available to you. This is what we are going to look at now. Just waiting for it to appear on your side. It takes a few seconds. There we are. Uh, Simam Kele, Simam Kele, you've got a hand up. Yes. Simam Kele. Would you like to ask or say something? Then you must just unmute your microphone. Mistake. Okay, no worries. We all do that. We all have little mishaps. No worries. No worries, Simon Kelly. No worries. Um, you really don't. You don't have to, to uh, apologize. We 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 all have mishaps once in a while. I've even accidentally switched on on my um, 
my camera once when I didn't intend to switch it on, and that wasn't that was quite embarrassing because I hadn't shaved for about three days before that. But anyway, that's besides the point. Let me just make this a bit bigger. Um, just want to see how it displays. It looks like it's now nice and clear and readable on your side, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this is class example one. So let us work through this one. We, we will definitely uh, uh, finish this one today. We might start with the second one as well today and finish it next week, but we'll see how far we get. <clears throat> So let us first maybe just see what is required of us. They say give the ledger entries. So this is our general ledger accounts for the financial years ended the 31st of December 2010 and the 31st of December 2011. So we must provide general ledger accounts for two years, right? The year ended end of December 2010 and the year ended 31st of December 2011. Oh, there's one thing that I forgot. There's one thing that I forgot. I wanted to ask you one more thing before we actually get to this, this, this uh, example. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say your financial year ends on the 20 or the last day of February. If your financial year ends on the last day of February, on or before which date must you then make your first provisional tax payment if you can type for us? I just want to make sure that you understand the principle. If your end, your financial year end is the 28th or 29th of February, last day of February, before or, or on which date must you make your first provision? Thank you. The last day of August, 30th or 31st of August, technically, but I would also say rather pay the day or so before. Thank you, students. You have the principle. That is just what I wanted to make sure. And then obviously your, your, your second provisional payment has to be made on or before the last day of the year. So technically the 28th of February, but once again, do it rather a day early. Okay, let us get back to our example. So, so, so they say December 2010, we made a provision for taxation. So that means we are providing for the income tax expense in our, in our general journal, right? So we are going to provide for the income tax expense. Now type for us, ladies and gents, because you've done many of these entries. When you are providing for the expense, which account are you going to debit? Which account are you going to debit when you have to do that entry where you provide for the income tax expense for that year? Which account do you debit? You've done many of them over the last few, few months. And we, just almost... did one, we just did one question four on share capital had that transaction in it. So we did it literally last week. Correct. We did one last, the last week, I remember. Days. Yeah. <laughs> Which account do we debit? Come, come, come. Oh, I've got load shedding. There goes my. I'm, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> it looks like you've got you've got load shedding, ladies and gents. Yeah. Which account are you going to debit? Income yeah, tax right. expense. There yeah, we yeah, go. Right. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Tim Bella. Thank you, Asiva, Kelsey. You are going to debit the income tax expense. Thank you, Mbele. Right. Which account are you going to credit? Obviously, with that same 100,000 rands. What did we call that account? It's quite a number of words. I think you preempted me, Elliot. You knew, Asiva as well, you knew what was coming. So you started typing earlier. Okay. Current tax payable, colon, income tax. So it's the current tax payable account. Kelsey, just remember you might have other kinds of taxes that you are also owing to the revenue service, such as dividends, tax, and so forth. So we are going to call it current tax payable, 100% correct, but there's a little tail to that, colon, income tax, right? 
So then we've got our first entry, ladies and gentlemen. We can now just go and briefly display. I don't want to actually. I actually want us to do the next one before I display anything, and then we can go to the third one. This uh, I've unfortunately now displayed, but anyway, you can see it on your side because the document is available. So taxation paid, the first and second payment. So what they are saying here during 2010, that financial year ending on the 31st of December 2010, we made a first provisional tax payment. We don't know how much. We made a second provisional tax payment. We don't know exactly how much. But at the end of the day, at the end of the year, the two combined, our first provisional tax payment plus our second provisional tax payment came to 100,000 rand. So we made a total, total payments in provisional tax during the year of 100,000, and we've also provided for a tax expense. So let us, of, of also 100,000. So let us just go and look at those, uh, uh, those entries. This was the first one, ladies and gentlemen, where we debited the taxation expense. We should actually add expense there. Taxation expense, and we credited the current tax payable income tax account with 100,000. So those two entries come from our journal entry. Then, ladies and gentlemen, what else would we have done? We have paid. We have paid the 100,000 rands. Now, I've asked a question like this to the first years this morning, and I was quite surprised that only about five or six of them answered it. If you make a payment, which account does it come from? Any payment. Your bank account, right? You are going to do an electronic funds trial. Thank you. You are much, much more responsive than the first years. I've got to give you credit, right? You all know that. That is why you are second years and not first years anymore. You know that. Okay, so you would have credited your bank account. And which account would you have debited? You cannot go and debit the expense again. Thank you for all those answers. Yes, correct. You are crediting your bank account. That's where you did the electronic funds transfers, the, EFT, the EFTs, from to the revenue service. Right. But remember, now you've paid, when you did that, you paid your income tax expense for the year in advance. It was a payment in advance, so it's a kind of a prepayment. We've done prepayments. We've actually done with the first year's prepayments last week. So it's quite fresh in my memory at the moment. Um, but anyway, it, it is similar to a prepayment. You are paying the, the, the expense that will only become due at the end of the year. You are paying it in advance. It is just like a, 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 an employee. Uh, when, when, when the employee's employer deducts the tax from, from that person's salary or wage, they are deducting it throughout the year, but it's actually paid in advance. Because the tax, your, your tax expense only becomes due at the end of the tax year, right? Therefore, during the course of the year, your current tax payable account will normally have a debit balance. It's only once you've accrued your tax, your income tax expense at the end of the year, that will, it will again come into credit. So your taxation provision would actually have been at the end of the year, whereas your, your, your two payments would have been before that. So before you provided for the income tax expense, that current tax payable account would have had a debit balance. That is where your prepayment for your income tax for the year is going to be recorded. So every time you make a payment, a provisional tax payment to the revenue service, you credit your bank account and you accumulate it on a prepayment account. But this is now a very special prepayment account called current tax payable, even though during the course of the year, it is really current tax refundable, right? But we know that by the time we've provided for the income tax expense, it will have become a payable again. It's only if you have to drop interim financial statements halfway due to, uh, throughout the year that you may find that, that you'll have to disclose it under your current assets as a current tax receivable. 
anyway, that is besides the point, even though we do have certain uh, examples of that, that we are going to work through when we do the various exercises. Now let us look at the next event that takes place. We are at the end of the year, so we've drawn up our financial statements. We've submitted the financial statements to the Revenue Service together with our tax return. Now in February 2011, so remember we've closed off our 20, uh, 2010 books of accounts already because we are now already in February 2011. There we receive back from the Revenue Service our tax assessment. So here they say the tax assessment for that year, for 2010, was received after the financial statements were not only drafted, but submitted to them, obviously, as well. And they then tell us, wow, well, aren't we lucky? They now tell us that according to their calculation, our income tax expense for that year should have been 93,900 rands. Now I'm going to ask you some questions again, ladies and gentlemen. They say our income tax expense, that's what the assessment is about, for last year should have been 93,900. How much tax expense have we already provided for last year in our books of account for the purposes of drawing up last year's financial statements? How much tax expense have we provided for? It's there in front of us. I was just going to say, and, one I was not asking you for the formula for rocket fuel. It's right there. He's just gone through those two sentences. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Worth. Thank you, students. Yes, you are all spot on. Right there, we've got plenty, many, many, many answers. Right, and they are all correct. Not a single one is not correct. Right, so we've already provided 100,000. So my next question, ladies and gentlemen, last year or, or, or during the beginning of this year, but for last year, when we drew up last year's financial statements, did we provide for too much income tax expense or for too little? You can just type too much or too little. Too much. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Asime. Thank you, everybody. There we go. All of you, we are on the same page. Right, fantastic. We've provided too much because we provided for 100,000 rands worth of tax expense, but now the Revenue Service gives us a, a, a late Christmas present and tells us, no, according to our calculations, you only have an income tax expense for last year of 93,900. So that 100,000 100, rands that we have provided, was that an over provision or an under provision? Over provision. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Shamila. Thank you, everyone. So we over provided. We provided too much. We refer to that as an over provision. Why this term is quite important to us, we'll see, not today yet, maybe today, we'll, who knows, but very soon we will see that is a description that we have to use when we drop our income tax note. We're going to have an income tax expense note, just like we have notes for almost every item on the face of our financial statements. And then we'll have to go and disclose whether there was an over or an under provision. So if we had provided less than 93,900, let's say we've provided only 90,000 last year, that would have meant that we had an under provision. Okay, so this, in this case, it's an over provision. So ladies and gentlemen, now it becomes interesting. Now the plot thickens. If we now want to do, and we must, we must do an adjustment for that. We can't just ignore it, right? Because we, 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 our books of account does not, does not at the moment then reflect reality, right? So the reality is that our income tax expense for last year should only have been 93,900, right? But we did our best. We did our best to calculate it correctly, to estimate it correctly. So it's no, it's, it's, there's no wrongdoing here. It is just we were a little bit inaccurate. 
or maybe we were just lucky that SARS made an error and we're not going to investigate this one. <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously, we are going to check it right. So, ladies and gentlemen, now to go and make that adjustment. For last year, but we're in this year's books of account, right? We must get our heads around that. It is for last year, but we are already in this year's books of account because last year's books have been closed off. It's done. Okay, we've carried our balances forward already. So, to make that adjustment, do we now have to go and decrease our income tax expense or increase our income tax expense relating to last year. Decrease, decrease. Thank you all for those answers. Thank you. You are absolutely correct because we've over provided. Thank you for all those answers. Everyone, everyone is spot on. So because we've over provided, we've provided too much. We've now got to decrease it, ladies and gentlemen which in turn means do we now to do this adjustment do we now have to go and debit the income tax expense or do we now have to go and credit the income tax expense credit credit oh no man you we, mrs moore our job is done <laughs> <laughs> These students have got it right. So now we've got to credit it because the expense has a debit. So it's already an, a, a debit account for any expense, but it we debited it by too much last year. So now to correct that in this year's books, we've got to go and credit it. Which now we know for every credit, we need an equal debit or at least some debits that in total equal with credit. Which account are we now going to debit? I can ask that same question in a different way. Which account reflects our liability to the revenue service? Or alternatively, which account was involved when you provided for that tax expense that was now ended up being an over provision? There's a third way of looking at it. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. So there are three ways in which you can look at it. So which account are now, we now going to debit? That will be the same account that we credited last no, no, time. No, 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 no. No, we're not making a payment. Sorry, Shamila, no, yes. The right track, but not the right word. Sorry, Mr. Van Bensberg. <laughs> no, no, you're welcome, I've Mrs. Moore. I, I love you know, it. I sometimes forget that I'm not in control of the class. I love it. I love it when you, when you jump in, Mrs. Moore. It gives me great Great pleasure, believe me. <laughs> I like it when when we we co-present almost if, if you know that 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 is I think the term the SIPA uh, um, chairperson also always talks about team teaching, team teaching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jack um, is on the right track there. Except he's again left out a couple of words. Yes, current tax yeah. payable for income tax. Okay, so there's actually quite a few things that we've now got to discuss. The one thing that it definitely can't be is your income tax expense because you've already you've already now just credited your income tax expense. So if you credit your income tax expense and you debit the income tax expense, you might as well have left it because then it has no effect. Right? So we've credited the income tax expense, the account that we are going to debit, and as we've seen, we can look at it in three ways. It is the account, or many ways at least, it is the account that was involved in the original provision for your income tax expense, which points to your current tax payable income tax account. It also points to the, to the um, yes, it is, uh, Shamila. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try and address that, that question just now. Uh, you can also see it in a different uh, in a different way. That current tax payable account, once you've once you've provided for the income tax expense, and Shamila, maybe this also answers your question, hopefully to a certain degree. That that balance on that current tax payable, that is why it is a payable for income tax, reflects what you believe you owe to the revenue service, right? 
That is what you believe you owe to the revenue service. But now, at the end of the year, we saw that we believed we owed the revenue service 100,000 rands. But what did we actually owe the revenue service? If you can just top that for us as well, ladies and gents. What did we actually owe the revenue service? 93,900. Thank you, Adonis. Thank you, Shamila. Thank you, Asive. Christopher. Yeah, okay. Wide awake. Yes, uh, very, very awake now. Very, 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 I'm very impressed. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it means that the fact that our current tax payable uh, uh, income tax account has got a zero balance at this stage, which means that, uh, you know, we've, pro we've, we've made provisional tax payments of 100,000, as you can see there. We've also provided for an income tax expense of 100,000. So our tax payments equaled, which is quite rare, equaled our provision for, for income tax expense. But ladies and gentlemen, what is the reality? The reality is that the revenue service is going to refund us a certain portion of income tax. Let's maybe get a figure here. How much are they going to refund us eventually? Thank you, Christopher. It's 6,100. Exactly. How did we get the 6,100, ladies and gentlemen? We've paid them 100,000 rands. Thank you, Simon Kele, my hero for the day. There you've provided us with the calculation as well. Right. So what has happened, ladies and gentlemen? We paid them 100,000 rands uh, during last year for provisional tax, our provisional tax payments. Uh, but we only needed to pay them 93,900 according to their calculations. So the difference between the 100,000, as Simon Kele has mentioned there, and the 93,900 that we should have paid, don't know whether I've said the same figure twice now, let me start again. The difference between the 100,000 that we have paid and the 93,900 that 900 rands 93,900 rands that we needed to pay, that difference of 6,100 rands, SARS will refund to us. Before we go further, there was just one other thing that I mentioned uh, that I wanted to address. One of the students uh, earlier, let me just go back up, if you don't mind me uh, uh, identifying you. Oh, it was quite a, quite a, quite, quite, Shamila, Shamila, with Shamila, uh, mentioned the SARS, right? SARS, South African Revenue Service. Now, um, you know, Mrs. Moore and myself and some of our colleagues have debated this, this quite often. Uh, yes, in practice, you could have called your current tax payable income tax account your SARS account, but then also don't just call it SARS, call it SARS colon income tax, right? So you can call that, you can call your general ledger account. There is nothing wrong with that. And I know many companies actually do that, right? Because they are only dealing with one tax authority. But ladies and gentlemen, there are two things that, were, that we've got to bear in mind here, two additional considerations. The one additional consideration, the one additional consideration is that when you disclose the credit in your SARS account, you still got to disclose it in your financial statements. In other words, under your current liabilities on the face of your statement or financial position, you've still got to go and disclose it as current tax payable colon income tax, irrespective of, of what you called your ledger account, right? There's also a second consideration and that is that most companies, especially large companies, do not only deal with one tax authority. They do not only deal with a revenue service. They might have business dealings or a branch in the United States of America, and they might also have to pay tax in the United States of America, which means in turn, ladies and gentlemen, they also have dealings with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. Or they might have business dealings in, in, let's say, Britain or wherever, 
and they might have therefore have to pay tax in Britain. So your current tax payable income tax really reflects all the various tax authorities, what you owe to them or what they owe to you and the amounts that you've paid to them, right? So you have one current tax payable account, one current tax payable income tax for all the tax authorities. If you call your, your uh, account SARS income tax and you have dealings with the IRS in America, it means you'll have to have another another account which you will then call irs colon income tax right so for for our purposes for, for all our dealings with all the various tax domains in the world all the various tax authorities that we have to deal with we group it together and we just create one current tax payable colon income tax uh, account and as we've already mentioned probably many times not only today, over the last few weeks as well, when you disclose it in your statement of financial position, you've got to describe it as current tax payable, colon, dot, dot, income tax in any case. Okay, ladies and gents, right, so let us see if we can find that entry. There we go. So now our current tax payable, once we've received uh, that, 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 that assessment, we have to go and reduce our liability. In fact, in this, in this instance, we actually go and create a debtor. We can go and create a debtor. Um, and, and, and at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, and at this, <coughs> excuse me, and at the same time, we have to decrease our taxation expense, which is why we credited current tax payable income tax 6,100 rands. Just as a matter of interest, this example is very simple, right? This is a very straightforward example. The next one that we are going to be doing is a little bit more complicated and a more advanced and, in fact, a, more, a little bit more accurate. Let's say we have not had this at the end of the 2012 year yet. We've not, uh, we've not provided for the new year, the 2011 year, the next year's provision yet. We haven't made any tax payments during the course of the year yet now this hopefully is a very i know it's a silly question because it's so simple but i still want you to uh, to answer it for me so you haven't made any provisional tax payments you haven't provided for your income tax expense yet but you have corrected once you've received your tax assessment you have corrected the the, the uh, balance in your current tax payable account then that current tax payable income tax account, if you can type for me, what will be the balance on the account at that point in time? Remember, those other entries come later. They come at the, uh, well, the first provisional tax payment will only come in June. Second provisional tax payment in December. Our provision for income tax expense also in December. What will be the balance on that current tax payable account after we've adjusted for our overpayment, which was also coincidentally an, uh, an overprovision? We'll talk about the difference between overprovision and overpayment later on when, when we have a more complicated example. In this case, our current the, the, the provision for income tax expense and our uh, provisional tax payments action. Yes, they actually equaled one another, which is quite unusual. Uh, so in this case, our underpayment and our underprovision or overpayment and overprovision will be the same. But later, when those two are different, we are going to discuss the difference between an under or overpayment and an under or overprovision. Excuse me, Mrs. Moore. Now, I was just going to say that it seems as if this payment has netted off the refund we receive from SARS against the provisional payments that we've made. That is why, do you get what I'm saying? Because at this point, students, if you are looking at the account on the 28th of February now, um, you get what I'm saying here? Because nowhere in this account does it show that we received the refund from SARS.
Is that the question you were asking the students to? You were asking them, what would the balance on this account be? So if you look at the account on the 28th of February students, the only entry in there is that tax expense on the debit side representing this um, entry that you've just made now. Let me not interfere with you, Mr. Fundins, because maybe I'm confusing the students with what I'm seeing. Okay, so rather no, you no, just no. Okay, so uh, students, what I'm saying, if you look at your current tax payable colon income tax account, right, and you are only now, let's say in March, March of 2011, so in other words, you haven't made any provisional tax payment yet, so that, that entry, I'm just going to point it out, that entry there does not exist yet, you haven't closed or balanced off your account yet, you haven't estimated your income tax expense for the 2011 year yet, so what would be the balance on that account be, let's say in March? 6,100 rand, thank you, Fanny. Okay, exactly, there we go, thank you, Christopher. Right, so it means that would have been, uh, that would have had, thank you, Shamila, that account would have had a, a debit balance, which means it's a debtor of 6,100. And what would then normally have happened is, which we don't have in this example, but I'm just talking into the future when we get to more realistic ones, is that the SARS, the revenue service, or whichever re the revenue service would have refunded you that amount. So let us just imagine that entry now already. So if they are refunding you that amount, which account will you then debit? Let's start there. The easiest account to think of on earth. Bank, Welcome. there we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You receive money. What in fact they do, they are going to do an EFT, an electronic funds transfer from their bank account, one of their many bank accounts, to your bank account, right? So you're going to debit bank, and they are obviously going to pay you 6,100 rands. Now they don't owe you money anymore. They owed you money for 2010, but now they don't owe that anymore because they've paid it. So which account will be the appropriate account to go and credit? If you can type that for us, please. A minute ago, you said your current tax payable for income tax account on the 28th of February, and therefore on the 1st of March, would have added this balance brought down of 6,100, this debit balance of 6,100. So if they've now paid you the 6,100, they don't owe you anything anymore, then certainly an entry in the account is necessary. Isn't that so? Exactly, students. So that self-same account, current tax payable, colon, income tax, that at the moment reflects what SARS owes you, right? What SARS owes you, right? So what you now have to go, there is no such an account as current tax payment, Christopher. You haven't got an account called current tax payment. You've got an account called income tax expense, and you've got an account called current tax payable, colon, income tax. Those are the two income tax related payable. There we go. <laughs> I know that's what you meant. That's what you meant. But I was just making sure uh, in case, right? Quite correct. So it's going to be your current tax payable. Once you've done that entry, you've debited your bank account, you've credited your current tax payable income tax account. What is the balance on that account then? Thank you, Fanny. What is the balance on that account then? It had a debit balance of 6,100. We've just said now that you are going to credit it with 6,100 when you receive the refund from SARS. So yes, did right, Fanny, the balance is then zero. Precisely, thank you, Mrs. Moore. Thank you, uh, Fanny and Christopher for those answers. Zero, right, zero. So we start our whole tax cycle afresh. That is actually the point that I was working to. So now we've got a clean slate, right? We've got a clean slate. We haven't provided for income tax expense yet, so there's no balance on that account. That is clean, right, for, for the new year, the 2011 year. And now, once we've, once we've done the adjustment for our over-provision, or it could have been for an under-provision, which was, just works the opposite way around, 
And once we've received our refund or made our, our, our top-up tax payment, if that would, would have been the case, we start with a clean slate. So that current tax payable income tax account now has a zero balance, which means that our next year's tax cycle can commence. I hope that makes sense, right? So you basically now start afresh because now even though you're already in March or even, even April, depending on how long it takes for, for sales to do the refund, normally they have to do it within 21 days after, after issuing the assessment. But it, well, so they, they will do it. Uh, so, but let's say we're already in March. Now we start afresh, right? So only now are we done with last year's tax affairs. That is the point, right? So we're only done with last year's tax affairs now, three months into the new year. And now six months into the new year, we are going to start our next cycle. Next, next tax cycle, which is our 2011 tax cycle. What is, what is, how are we going to start it? With what are we going to start it? Maybe you can type it for us there. I'm going to give you a good hint. It will be on or before the, uh, the, the last day of June. So what will happen? What will start this new tax cycle for 2011? And it will happen on or before, very close to the last day of June. You are going to... Starts with a P, there yeah. We go. First of the payment. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Asime. <laughs> then you are going to make your first provisional tax payment for the next year. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I know I've, I've been going very slow, um, and our time is slowly running out as well. Uh, so let us just then at least finish this one. So, ladies and gentlemen, in 20, uh, for the 2011 year, they say, let's first of all start with our provisional tax payments. They say we've made a first and a second provisional tax payment. We don't know the exact amounts. Uh, that hasn't been given to us, but we know that in total, in aggregate, those two combine for a total of 72,000 rand. So that was our uh, uh, first and second provisional tax payments combined. For both those transactions, I realize that it's two separate transactions, right? The one would have been recorded, let's say, on the 29th of June 2011. The other one would have rec been recorded on, let's say, the 29th of December. But the debit and the credit would be the same accounts. So when you make that payment, which account are you going to credit? Let's start with the easy one. Which account in both cases would you have credited? You are making provisional payments. I'm just reminding you. Yes. Payment. Um, I think you thought I was going to say the debit side first, but this time I said the credit side first. So Timbela has this one correct, right? So I asked which, which one we are going to credit, and that will be the bank account. Now we can get to the which one are we going to debit, and that is not the income tax expense account. The same as we did last year, the same as we do every year. This tax cycle repeats itself. We are making a, a prepayment. That is what a provisional tax payment means. We are making a prepayment of our tax for the year that still has to end. It hasn't ended yet. So there isn't an income tax expense yet. So which account are we going to debit? Where do we accumulate our prepayment? Current tax payable, there we go, okay. I'll forgive you all for not typing income tax because I know it takes a while to type all those words. But in principle, yes, it's going to be your current tax payable income tax account, right? Then when we get to the end of the year, or actually after the end of the year, but we'll backdate it to the end of the year, so we'll backdate it to the 31st of December. Thank you, Tembela, spot on. So we'll backdate it to the 31st, uh, 31st of December 2011, even though we're probably only going to do the provision somewhere in March when we are busy drawing up our finance, uh, not March, in, in January, I should say, when we are doing our, our financial statements. 
So there we see that we are providing, we are providing for an income tax expense for 80,000 rands. When we provide that, ladies and gentlemen, now it means we are, even though we haven't quite, re well, we have realized that if you think about the accrual system, it means we are accruing that expense now. So which account are we going to debit when we provide for our income tax expense? This time I said debit first. Which account are we going to debit? Same as last year, same as every year. And we've already had it in this class. <laughs> yes. I sound like I sound like that guy from from what's it called? Um uh Anyway, we've got the right uh, answer there by Mr. Malley or Ms. Malley. Yes. Thank you. So income tax expense, dinner for one. That's the show that I was thinking. I don't know if any students know dinner for one. <laughs> that's a that's a, a, a 1950s comedy sketch that, that, that is usually played on television every old year's eve or new year's eve, last day of the year. Dinner for one. You can watch that there. That there the guy also says, like last year, like the year before, like every year. Okay, so the tax cycle just repeats itself. Which account are we now going to credit? Now we've got to raise the liability. Remember, as soon as you accrue an expense on the debit side, at the same time, you've got to raise that liability. Where? In which account are we going to raise that liability? It's the long one. <laughs> Current tax payable. Thank you, ladies and gents. Thank you, students. So you are going to debit your income tax expense account with, what was it? Let me go it's back to that. 80, uh, the 80,000. Oh, 80, 80, that one was still highlighted from the last one. <laughs> I was in the wrong sheet. Okay, so you're going to debit your income tax expense with 80,000 and you're going to credit your current tax payable colon income tax account. So that means you've accrued the expense. You can draw up your financial statements for the 2011 year. You've raised the corresponding liability. So you're going to disclose that as part of your, the balance on that account as part of your uh, current liabilities in your statement of financial position. So that is what we have here, ladies and gentlemen. There we can see in our current tax payable, the uh, uh, provisional tax payments that we have made. Our, our contra account in both cases was the bank account, uh, and it totaled 72,000 rands. We are going to now, once we've done that, we, can, uh, we must still go and record our income tax expense. So we've estimated the income tax expense at 80,000. So we are going to credit our current tax payable income tax. We are going to de uh, debit our income tax expense. And there it is, the 80,000, right? And we know we've already credited that at an earlier stage. So ladies and gentlemen, the last part that we need to now understand here is that we are going to balance off we are going to balance off this account because it is a so-called balance sheet account. It appears on your statement of financial position. So if you balance it off, you are going to transfer, you're going to get a credit balance at the beginning of the next year. You can see there 80,000 is your total on the credit side. If you add those two up, it comes to 78,100, 78,100. So your balancing figure is 1,900. You all know from last year how to properly balance off an account. So you yeah. pay it forward and there you've brought it forward to the new financial year. So according to your, your record keeping, according to you, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, at the end of the year, do you owe money to the revenue service or do the revenue or does the revenue service owe money to you? I know that's a mouthful and that's a long story to, to answer. But being a creditor, do you owe or do they owe? It's quite a short. They owe or we owe? Who if owes? You count as a credit balance, we owe. We owe. We owe. We owe. Thank you, Asiwe. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. Okay, so now it has a credit balance. So it means, according to us, 
we owe the money, right? But we haven't received our tax assessment yet, so we're not even sure what the tax man is going to calculate, so we'll have to wait for 2012. Sometime in 2012, probably February or March, we will receive our tax assessment to see whether we have to go and make an adjustment in the 2012 year for the 2011 year. The other important point, sorry, I'm running a little bit over my time. The other important point here, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll see later on when we do the income tax expense note, as well as our financial statements, why this also becomes important. In the case of the tans taxation expense, just like any other expense or any other income is not going to be balanced off. You're not going to carry a balance forward. It is going to be closed off. Right. We know that certain certain kinds of, of, of trading expenses uh, gets uh, written off to or, or closed off, I should say, closed off to a trading account and then other expenses and most income items gets closed off to the profit and loss or profit or loss account. Right. So what happens in this case? What is the amount that we are going to close off? Well, we see that we've provided for an income tax expense for this year for 80,000, but we over provided last year by 6,100. So we decreased our income tax expense. So the amount that we now have to close off, this, this adds up, the debit side adds up to 80,000, the credit side um, has already got that 6,100 entry. So the balancing figure is 73,900. But now we're not carrying it forward. We're closing it off to our profit or loss account. Last question of the day, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to ask you, which amount, the 80,000 or the 73,900, which of those two will appear as an income tax expense on the face, the main page, the face of your statement of comprehensive income. Last question for the day. Which of those two amounts will appear in your statement of comprehensive income? It's a trick question, so don't even ask, uh, don't answer it. It's all right. You'll see later on why this becomes important and later on it will, it will also make sense. Because it's the 73,900 that appears uh, that 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 close off to profit or loss exactly that you are correct Fili, and i see there and uh, mabasa thank you you are correct that is the amount that is going to appear on the face of your statement of comprehensive income but now the the, the user of the financial statements might might be slightly confused why are you showing an income tax expense of 73,900, but your tax expense for this year was actually 80,000 rands, right? That's where the note comes in. That is where we are going to provide some additional information to the users of the financial statements, where amongst other things, we are, reconcile, we are going to reconcile this year's current tax, uh, uh, this year's this current year's, I should say, this current year's income tax expense with the amount that we actually show as an income tax expense. But we'll get to the note next time. It's already quarter past. Sorry, I've, I've, I've basically overstayed my welcome by five minutes already. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. Thank you, students, for attending. We appreciate that. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your next classes. Bye-bye.